Chin Gong is gone. What happened? What does it all mean? Matt Brazil, who writes for Spy Talk, is a China analyst at Blue Path Lab and fellow at Jamestown, is here to maybe clear up at least a little bit of what happened over the past month. So over the next, um, you know, half hour, Matt and I are going to be talking about very rumorly unverified things. Uh, I think we caveat ourselves pretty consistently throughout the show, but nothing of this should be taken with a grain of salt. And Matt, I respect as a serious, thoughtful um, person who's not going to oversell things. So um, just like disclaimer, we are talking about moving events. It is uh, uh, 6 p.m. on July 25th, and that's all. Anyways, Matt, anything else we should say before we get into all of this? Well, we're, we're slicing and dicing rumors here. We're not necessarily serving them up on whole grain bread. Matt, welcome back to China Talk. Let's start with the facts. Um, what do we actually know? We actually know that exactly one month after he had his last meeting in public, it was announced that he was no longer the foreign minister and that Wang Yi, the former foreign minister, who is also on the Politburo, is now the foreign minister. And that is very interesting because it means that that's the first time somebody has been foreign minister and a Politburo member at the same time since Chen Chi Chen from 1992 to 98. So that's a clear uh, difference in the power dynamic at the top in foreign affairs. And we also know that in all likelihood, Chin Gong was having uh, some sort of extramarital affair, maybe even had a child, with Fu Xiaoqian, the Phoenix television presenter, who had a, uh, a high-flying interview program with Phoenix, and she hasn't been around since uh, April the 10th. So, Matt, bold and very spicy claim. What is your evidence for that? Well, the evidence is tentative, and it belongs in Fu Xiaotian's social media. So on Twitter and on Instagram, she made it pretty clear that A, she has a baby, B, that um, the pregnancy began in February 2022, which she designated as a special day. And in the same post on Instagram, she included a picture of Chin Gong. And this led to her followers exclaiming that, oh, you're having Chin Gong's or you had Chin Gong's baby. And she didn't deny it. Of course, there were people both mocking and uh, congratulating her for that and just observing that. So the fact that she didn't deny it and let those comments go on and on seems to indicate something. And that's something, it seems, uh, you know, had become, uh, the cat was out of the bag, whichever cat it really was. And I think under those circumstances, the party had to do something about it. And that was in, in uh, April when it all became more clear. And on April 10th, she went back to China and said that she was going back to, uh, she didn't say face the music specifically, but she did say she was going back to the front line and and uh, made a, a series of cryptic comments that indicated that she was kind of in trouble. So that's what we know. Um, what, what What's the whole deal with the jet? The jet is part of another interesting wrinkle to this, and that's how much money she had and how she had that money, God knows how. Um, she was renting a very expensive home in Southern California, which Zillow rates at $15 million and uh, goes for rent at $48,000 a month. Uh, she had given a big series of gifts that are undisclosed in their nature to Churchill College at Cambridge University and had a garden named after her. And on the Churchill College website, you can see a picture of Fu with a shovel along with someone else from Cambridge. And then there's this private jet. So who was piloting it and so on is uncertain, but she was living quite the lavish lifestyle. So that had to come from somewhere and that may indicate all sorts of things, but there's no way to verify at this point where the money came from. So um, teasing this out for a second, how does a foreign minister have this much pocket money? Well, how did Xi Jinping's daughter go to Harvard? Uh, 
these are these are the questions of uh, Chinese elite politics. It's difficult to say, and um, time will only tell. Of course, the the downfall of apparent downfall of Xinjiang, and apparent uh, questioning by the Central uh, Discipline Inspection Commission may result in some um, in some revelations. But another uh, part of this, of course, is that we do know that Chen Gong was uh, fast-tracked by Xi Jinping through the bureaucracy to become a vice foreign minister and then foreign minister. Um, and we know that um, part of this is unconfirmed, but uh, we know that uh, for certain that his first assignment out of college was to work for the Diplomatic Services Bureau in Beijing, which is uh, ostensibly part of the foreign ministry, but um, I've, I've heard for over 30 years from reliable sources that it's really controlled by the Ministry of State Security uh, for obvious reasons. They're the ones, DSB, are the ones who provide personnel to uh, foreign diplomatic missions in China, and they're the only ones who are allowed to do that. They have a monopoly. There's a commentator in the Spy Talk article that we published on the 20th of July. We noted the um, comments from John Chechik, uh, a former diplomat who's now in Taipei, and he laid out, uh, it, it's all in the article, he laid out a, uh, a whole series of events that he believes indicates that um, Chen Gong uh, was at least for a while an MSS officer. Um, I think that is yet to be, as you say, teased out. So does it make any difference to how this plays out for him if he if he used to be a spy? He would be subject to more discipline if he had any connection with state security because they have, I think, uh, extremely high expectations of their officers. And when their officers have been convicted of um, malfeasance in the past, such as Ma Jian, the former Minister of MSS, the punishments are very severe. Um, so another aspect of this is that if Chin Gong was uh, either active MSS or he had a strong background in MSS um, and was promoted up to being foreign minister um, during this time when Chen Wen Ching, the former MSS minister who's now um, uh, at a higher post in the party, um, at the Political Legal Commission, that simultaneous rise of the two would seem to indicate that state security was being placed in a perhaps uh, elevated position in, in relation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It, according to um, people I've been speaking with lately, uh, former government uh, analysts and such, it used to be that, that MSS was... Um, in a disadvantageous position in the embassies overseas um, compared to MFA, compared to Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the rise of Chen Wenqing to higher power, along with the, I think, uh, clear priority being put on gathering more intelligence from um, potential adversary nations and getting as much technology as possible under the current adverse circumstances for buying technology overseas, the um, enhanced export controls and such, under those circumstances, it seems as if um, there was uh, some coordination there in raising the status and power of the security apparatus. So um, we've laid the facts out. We have uh, Qing Gong as foreign minister out uh, we have a lot of smoke around this whole sort of um, kept woman, uh, love child uh, business. Uh, we have some uh, relatively new data points of him uh, sort of rising up the ranks potentially uh, within the MSS. Um, but now we get to the real juicy stuff. Matt, what are some of the, uh, uh, the rumors you've been hearing? And maybe we'll go in terms of, uh, let's start with least credible and we'll sort of build to, um, uh, to most potentially realistic. Least credible. Well, um, I'd say that the least credible would be that Xi Jinping's wife, Peng Li Yuan, is uh, good friends with Qin Gong's wife, 
and that Chin Gong's wife went to Peng Li Yuan and, and uh, said, you've got to do something about that man. Uh, there could be something to that. But but it's it, I say it's less credible because I've only heard it from one source and I can't find anything indicating that there's anything to it. There's no way to confirm it at all. And then there's another one, a uh, intelligence analyst in East Asia who's working for an East Asian government was telling me that there are a lot of internet rumors that Chin Gong died in bed at the PLA 301 hospital in, in Beijing. And that could be true too, because we haven't heard from him. And there's been no pictures, no nothing, no no Chin Gong in the uh, in the witness or the accused doc in a court or anything like that, that which would still be to come. But there's no no evidence there. There's uh, it's, it's just people saying my old buddy in Beijing said this or that. And so th those are very interesting and may prove to be true, but they're less than credible. At the same time, I think that the information on Fu's um, social media is somewhat credible. It's only her saying these things, but her account of, um, of uh, having a baby and hinting that it's that it's Chin Gong as, as the father, it fits, you could say, with the objective circumstances. And it's it's kind of a weird thing to brag about if it wasn't true, because it could really get you in trouble. It certainly could. And, you know, there's also speculation that, that Fu was uh, an MSS asset of some sort. And I say asset, not officer, but asset, a recruited agent. And uh, it's it's certainly true, according to um, more than one source that I've spoken with who are reliable, that Phoenix Television is not owned by MSS like like the uh, Diplomatic Services Bureau is, but uh, it's used by MSS to place officers. And and so with her record of interviewing so many prominent people, including uh, Ban Ki Moon and John Kerry and many others. She'd be a great target to recruit yeah. uh, if you wanted to make sure you got all the information about uh, who is related to who, who knows who, and so forth, which is an, a favorite uh, thing for MSS to do. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the question then is, Matt, is like, if you're sort of in on it, like, why would you be so dumb? Because then you start to get into like soap opera shit, right? Of like, maybe she, she was trying to get back at him because he was, she was mad at her or something. Because, like, this doesn't end well if it, like, comes out to the world that it turns out that you have a, a uh, you know, a child out of wedlock with a, with a senior CCP official. That's certainly true. And the reason why I brought up that she doesn't seem like an MSS officer who is disciplined and trained, that she seems more like, uh, if at all, this is total conjecture now, if she, if she were an asset... It's not unusual for people who are recruited into the spying game to uh, behave well for a while, and then they start to have regrets, and then they start to do weird things. Um, they, it, be, it can be difficult to control them because they become frightened. They start to have big regrets. Um, there's an interesting website, by the way, um, where there's a, uh, a theory of the of the recruited spy of the of the inside trader, which doesn't apply to China, but it's a good set of human observations at the site called noirforusa.org. That's N-O-I-R, the number four, USA.org. The person who, who formulated that theory is a uh, psychiatrist who's interviewed a lot of um, former spies against America who are in prison now. Um, so there we are coming up our ladder of credibility uh if it's not she's wife then who else might um uh, might be playing a role here well it also could be this this gets into more conjecture now but i think it's it also fits into the scenario uh it, it's also possible that people um on the inside of the ministry of foreign affairs um suddenly got some backbone and decided to report on uh, chin gong and the reason I say that is that uh, his rapid ascent and his possible uh, previous affiliations or present affiliation with state security um, could very well 
have um, caused jealousy and resentment inside the ministry. And if he were actually conducting an extramarital affair in the United States while ambassador, that would make him, of course, a recruiting target for the Americans. And that would be a big uh, security issue. So it could be that after some period of time where people were just scared to death of him, and there's some information out there indicating that people were typically scared to death of him, uh, his subordinates feared him. After some period of time, it could be um, that people, uh, one or two people decided enough's enough. And that's something I've seen happen too in other, uh, other problems regarding corruption inside of uh, corporations in Asia. Continuing on our, on our, on our credibility ladder, um, what's, what's next, Matt? Um, I think that is pretty much it. There's no more reliable information besides this. And we're really waiting for one or more, more shoes to drop. We still, for example, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for something official about Chen Gong. We know that only that he has lost his job. Um, and we're also waiting for something official about Fu Xiaotian, if if anything like that will be uh, will be publicized. Uh, it's it's interesting also, uh, as far as a small factoid, that the information on Chen Gong, as reported by Bonnie Glazier this morning on Twitter, the information on Chen Gong, the pages about him on the Foreign Ministry website have been largely wiped out. It's as if he didn't exist. He also was taken off the list of former foreign ministers, uh, which is not an unusual thing in China. Pictures of uh, Zhang Qing on the Long March, pictures of Lin Biao on the rostrum in in uh, Communist Party conclaves uh, after they were they were uh, disgraced were were um, photoshopped out. So that would be a normal response by this bureaucracy we have one we have one strand left right he's still on the politburo that may still be true but if it is i don't think it's going to last much longer is there anything we can sort of conclude on the you know there's been there's been a lot of discussion like this was she's guy he promoted him over this that and the other person is there anything that's like remotely responsible to say in terms of like takeaways for the future direction of of Xi's foreign policy or, um, you know, his his broader standing in the party that we can uh, divine from the story? Well, I'm watching carefully to see if any news comes out about Chen Wenqing, the uh, former MSS um, minister who is now with the Central Political Legal Commission, um, because uh, if if the plan to raise the stature and ability of state security in relation to the foreign ministry has been reversed, then we may see something about Chen Wenqing maybe being shuffled around somewhere else. Um, but I think it's premature. A lot, a lot of people on the Chinese uh, anti-communist press are saying that this is bad for Xi Jinping. He's going to be embarrassed. It's uh, it's a terrible mistake. People are going to think he's incompetent and all that sort of thing. But the power that he has accumulated at this point, where there's even a draft law being uh, considered to make Xi, the study of Xi Jinping thought mandatory for practically everybody, his power base at this point is, is very strong. And if we look back at what happened when Lin Biao um, got in that Trident jet and tried to fly to Russia and crashed in Mongolia back in 1971, uh, he was Mao Zedong's successor. And at the time, people were saying, oh, look, Mao Zedong has made a terrible choice for successor. This will embarrass him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and nothing happened. The regime found a way to uh, paint him as a uh, terrible villain. And so I think another thing to watch for, of course, is what the regime comes out and says about Chen Gong. Are they going to uh, remain silent forever? Are they going to come out and give a list of his crimes, which will probably include uh, the extramarital affair, but could also include a lot of other stuff they make up on the spot? 
I, I don't think Xi Jinping's position will be threatened. You know, it is possible that eventually uh, Xi Jinping will be voted out by uh, people in the Central Committee for pursuing harebrained schemes like Khrushchev was in 1964. But I think that day is a long way off. Okay, so um, so Matt, I want to close with a, uh, a reading from our friend uh, Kang Sheng, who was a... Uh, you know, who would like ran the internal security apparatus during the um, Cultural Revolution and is like a horrible human being. But Joseph Terigian, a longtime friend of the pod, uh, recently tweeted out a quote from him saying, uh, uh, by which he meant like, like the Russians. common turn. Uh, um, basically, like, like the foreign, our foreign communist friends have no idea what the hell is going on with our party. But like, honestly, even we, even me, the freaking head of um, security for the party has no idea what the hell is going on. So much less two white guys recording a podcast halfway around the world uh, really have any real sense of exactly what it did that uh, exactly what is, is, is going on when you see these sort of internal party machinations end up sort of manifesting in public. So uh, Matt, any cl- maybe close us out with any sort of reflections on um, uh, on uh, the wisdom of uh, of Kang Sheng. Well, not to uh, get political here, but Beijing, if you're listening, you really ought to open up those archives and let us see what was actually going on. One of the things that has often it doesn't really puzzle me as much as I find it frustrating about the Chinese Communist Party is that they don't seem to realize how important China is to the world. They say they do, they posture like they do, but if they realized how important China is to the world, what Kang Sheng said wouldn't be true. In other words, they would try to communicate what's going on in China to the rest of the world without just bathing it in silly propaganda. The world needs to understand China better and the Chinese Communist Party is not helping So, Matt, your last book, Chinese Communist Espionage, an intelligence primer we did a show about, I guess, a year ago. You're currently working on a new project. I don't know if you want to do a like a little preview or if you're still taking like random diaries uh, from people, if they have any fun uh, Chinese spy material for you. Yeah, this book is uh, the first book was was meant to be a handbook for specialists and and a reference work. Uh, This next book is intended to be for the general reader, somebody who is not necessarily sheep dip in everything Chinese communist through a graduate school career or anything like that. And so it's intended to inform the general public in a better way about who are the intelligence and influence organs of the party. Uh, what are their roots? A little bit on that, the early history, but also what I like to call the making of China's modern techno Czechists, that is uh, Czechist from the Russian Revolution, and what they've been doing too, that's rather unusual, although it also shows a parallel with the Americans, quite frankly, using private contractors to do some of their work. They do that one way, while the Americans, of course, have built up a uh, immense network of private companies doing intelligence work, uh, millions of people who have security clearance um, doing work for the Americans as well. So I'm, I'm hoping to put it all into perspective that somebody who's not a specialist can grasp. Awesome. Well, can't wait to have you back on the show to discuss. Matt Brazil, this was a pleasure.